And so as we continue our worship, and uh, I would ask you to turn back to the text I read earlier, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. As we look at this section of the Bible here in, in Romans, this chapter, I ask the question in my own mind, thinking through uh, coming together today, is what's going on with our culture? I mean, what's the tragedy of what we're facing today? Yes, I know for some of you the tragedy is you've had to live with other sports. I get that. But there are from more serious issues that we've had to face over these months. Troubling, troubling things. Whether it's health issues, psychological problems, the division that seems to have started down in the United States and has fostered uh, ill will and problems and challenges in Canada and around the world and determining what is right and wrong and how do we relate as human beings. Just all of these things seem to be crashing together in such a way that our culture seems to be shifting and shifting in ways that uh, are certainly not pleasant, nor do they seem to be shifting in ways that honor God. These events and all of the slogans and rhetoric that's going on is troubling to many of us, particularly, I think, to the younger generation, the little children that we have, and the teenagers and the college students who, they are the ones who are stepping forth that have to carry the load of this world. Uh, many of us in that upper echelon of age, shall we say, and getting closer to glory, it affects us as well. But our prayer should be not just for this generation, but for those to come. What will they be seeing? And, and these are very, shall we say, cataclysmic times with all of these happening around us. What do we do with that? Well, interestingly enough, we're reminded of at least two things in trying to answer that. Number one, the events that we're facing in our day and age and these cultural shifts and so on are not new. It's not as if the world hasn't been through similar situations in the past. In the present, as we face them, they might seem to be the worst things that ever happened in society in the history of the world. That may be true, but I doubt it. It, like so many other events, have bring people to the point of decision and wondering what to do and what will happen to the next generation. And in the midst of these changing times, God still is the same. There is no change there. And so at the very least, even before we look to God's word, here is the reminder for you and for me is that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're a child of God, then the one thing we need most remains unchanged. That's the character of our holy God who loves and supports his children. But the second thing we learn from this is that God's word speaks to this generation. It speaks to the problems of our day. It is not as if we have faced some new and strange thing that the Word has nothing to say about. That we're flipping through the pages of Scripture and saying, I don't know how to deal with this. I can't find it in the Bible. God's Word speaks to every generation, every cultural shift, every problem and pandemic that comes along. God's Word, the truth of God's Word, speaks to that and to this generation. Now that, in large and general terms, brings us to the text before us, because we embark here today in chapter 12 of Romans on what many would call the, the practical section of Romans. Chapters 1 through 11, we're told you have the, the doctrinal, the theological, the the systematic teaching of the Apostle Paul. And now in chapter 12 to chapter 15, you have the, the practical section. As if in the first 11 chapters, there wasn't anything practical. And in chapters 12 and following, there's nothing doctrinal or theological. No, both of them have both. But there is a sense in which God, uh, Paul has been laying out the truth of justification by grace through faith in chapters 1 through 11. And even with chapters 9, 10, 11 as kind of a, a bit of a bracketed section that Paul inserts there, it's very doctrinally sound in relationship to justification by grace through faith. In the end of the chapter, the latter part of chapter 15 and chapter 16, Paul continues to teach us, but more in terms of relating to the, the brothers and sisters in Rome and greetings and goodbyes and so on. But now you have chapter 12 to really chapter, five, or chapter 15, verse 13, where Paul lays out now something of where this is going. And you see that when you look at the text before us here. Here in chapter 12, 
he begins to really pile into us the expectations of believers. Just look at, for a moment, if you have your Bibles in front of you, uh, look at some of the themes that, that Paul will begin to talk about in terms of, shall we say, application to the believer. In chapter 13, the whole concept of submission to authorities. What does that mean? A very apropos text in our day and age, wouldn't you say? In fact, the way we're conducting services today is very much in relationship to how we submit to the authorities, Romans chapter 13. In chapter 14, the, the whole discussion there in terms of the weak and the strong. Uh, what does it mean to live by grace? And what is Christian liberty all about? How are we affected one with another? This goes on into chapter 15 and just the, the impact we have in relationship to each other and ultimately to the world. Well, these are very practical situations in which the truth of what Paul has said in the first 12 chapters need to be foundational. And so chapter 12 really begins us in that way, taking us here the specific issues that face Christians today, as they did in Paul's day in Rome. But he tackles these practical situations in light of the many important theological themes he has already developed in the first 11 chapters. In fact, as one writer has said, we can't understand the so-called practical section of Romans properly if we don't see this section as the direct application in daily life of those specific theological points Paul has already made, especially the fact that through G faith in Jesus Christ, we have already been reckoned righteous before God. So I would suggest here that what we have now is Paul, after laying the foundation of what it means to be reconciled to God, the expectation of life. In fact, if you go to the text with me and look at the very first word in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, what is that word? Therefore. Now, I'm sure that in many ways, you've had studies past, and people will tell you in good Bible study, when you see the word therefore, you have to figure out what the word is therefore. Why is it there? What, what's it doing? And, and again, you're all smart wise people, obviously the word therefore means based upon what we've heard, there are certain things we need to do, right? That's generally how we see the term. The question is, well, when Paul says therefore, what does he mean by that? Does he mean chapter 11, the last couple of verses, chapters 9 to 11, the first, 10 ver or first eight chapters in terms of things? What does he mean there? Well, arguments can be made for any number of ideas what Paul's therefore is. I would suggest that it's all of the above. That I think what Paul is doing is saying, here's how I've laid out the truth of justification by grace through faith, that God has a people, and he'll always have a people, and through grace he'll save them. And, and that's the, the principles that he's laid down thus far. And so the therefore really speaks to all that's here. Because of that, now here's some things you need to live out by faith. And these are critical to us. Back in the 1970s, some of you may have remembered a man by the name of Francis Schaeffer. He was a Christian philosopher and preacher and teacher and writer. And in the 70s, I remember as a teenager at Westboro Baptist Church, we went through the video series that was entitled, How Should We Then Live? And it was a series of studies that, you can, that are still very applicable to our day. In light of what was going on in the world, what should our lives be like as Christians? But the operative word in that statement is the word then. Schaefer didn't say, how should we live? Well, that's an obvious question to, that has application anywhere. It can be used, how should we live? Live this way, live that way. He said, how should we then live? Because of the erosion of our culture, how should Christians then live based upon what they've seen? And in a sense, that's what Paul is giving us here. He's not just saying, okay, now here's some things to live by, some, some commands and duties. He's really saying, how should we then live based upon the truth of what I taught you in the first 11 chapters? Do you understand that? We cannot separate the two. Christianity is all about what we believe and how we live. You can't just teach people how to live without the undergirding of the truth of God's Word in what they should believe. And you cannot just tell people what to believe without telling them how to live out what they believe. Do you see how these two need to be wedded together always and never divorced? But sometimes we divorce them. 
As Christians, sometimes we, we just, as it's part of my life, we love to study theology and have all of our, shall we say, theological ducks in a row and know the truth. And so we'll hammer away those first 11 verses and we've got it and we can write our own systematic theology and there we are. But if we don't wed to that, living it out, then we've missed so much of what the scriptures teach us. And again, similar fashion, you see where this is going. If we try and teach our children and our families, look, here are the good principles to live, just do this, do that. They could ask the operative question, why? There needs to be some foundation to say, live this way. Because this is the truth of what we believe. Now, I don't want to keep belaboring that, but you get that, right? That it's critical for us going forward from that to understand these things. Practical Christian living must be put in its place following knowledge of biblical truth. And so what we have here beginning in chapter 12, as one writer has said, this is God's righteousness in everyday life. Or as uh, theologian Doug Moo says, this is the Christian's response to God. Sorry, let me put that again. He summarizes here what the Christian's response to God's grace should be. And so go back to verse 1. When Paul says, therefore, all that I've shown you here should now lead you to a life that is committed to Christ, serving and following these principles. Because what we believe has consequences to life. Some of you have heard the term, ideas have consequences. That was a phrase and I think a book by a fellow by the name of uh, Richard Weaver, a philosopher back in the 1940s. Now his, his view of that was that ideas have consequences in the sense that we can control our destiny. And so what we think will help us develop how we live. But for the Christian, it's a matter of that which God implants in us as believers and that which we believe must consequentially lead to godly behavior. And so ideas as a Christian must have consequences. If I believe this, then my life should be lived and look a certain way. Would you agree? All right. So, so that's the important principle. The ideas have consequences. And you could stop even now to reflect on a few seconds on how are you doing on understanding and knowing the truth of God's Word? And on this underside, how are you doing on living it out? Now, I'll leave that to you to surmise and work out in your own life. But here we want to look then just briefly at two of, I would say, the foundational perspectives that Paul gives us just in the first two verses. And we'll leave further exposition, Lord willing, for next week. But just the first two verses for the time we have this morning, it's kind of introduction to this whole theme. But there's two real principles I want to see. Verse 1, Paul will show us here that, that one of the, shall we say, important outpourings of this, what we know, is to be a living sacrifice. Again, let me read verse 1, if you've forgotten it from when I read it earlier. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now, most of you here, and I'm sure those who are watching, have, have read that verse before, and along with verse 2. But I want you to see here, because this is what the, the therefore is based upon. Therefore, what you've heard and believed in these things, I want you to do something. And just walk through the verse here quite briefly with me here. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters... That tells us two things, at least. Number one, Paul has a heart for these believers in Rome. They're brothers and sisters. They're his Christian family. It's similar to what we have here gathered in this place. We are family, are we not? We call each other brothers and sisters. We love one another. There's a desire to help and encourage and care for each other. Is that not true? That's who we are. And Paul always displays that sense of love for the body of believers. They're his brothers and sisters. They're believers. They're, they're family, even though he can't be with them. Even though that he's not there, he's writing to them out of a great heart. But you see that even further in the second thing is that he has a desire for something really to take place in them. I urge you. I'm not suggesting here, he says. He's not saying, it'd be a great idea if you thought about these things. I urge you, I implore you, I call out to you as my family to do something. Listen, 
as we talk about our love for each other as brothers and sisters, there needs to be a deeper dynamic of concern that, that expresses itself in urging to one another. It needs to be more than, shall we say, the, the distant relationships that we have been forced into. I, I appreciate the Zoom meetings, but frankly, I'm getting tired of them. I want flesh and blood meetings, don't you? Just like we have here today. And so the, the, the character of our relationship should be such that we desire to be in each other's presence as we worship, as we fellowship, as we gather. Why? So that we can feed into each other's lives. That's what the body of Christ is called to do. There's this urging, this sense of desire, a heart for people, and ultimately in that heart for a people, a concern for the gospel. But notice further what he says. He says, first of all, I urge you, brothers and sisters, what? In view of God's mercy. He hasn't said what he wants them to do yet. But he wants to say, I love you, I'm urging you. But all of this is in view of God's mercy. Now, don't let that slip by too quickly. Paul is very concerned as he urges them that they'll recognize that everything he wants them to do, based upon what they've been taught, has as its undergirding the mercy of our holy God. The fact that God, which mercy is all about, has not punished us as we deserve. That's what mercy is. God hasn't done to them what they deserve because of their sin. He's shown mercy. And of course, when you go through the Scriptures, the New Testament, the many themes of mercy are found there, often reflecting and quoting from the Old Testament, God showing mercy to the people of Israel. Take time in your leisure to look at Luke chapter 1, verses 70 and following, where, where you have there talking about the mercy of God shown to His servant now. Even in, in chapter 9 of Romans, God says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. The, the mercy of God, this benevolent care and love that shows itself, it is in view of God's mercy that he does this. And the point is, again, it's something we don't deserve. In fact, that's what Ephesians chapter 2 says, verses 4 and 5. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. But because of his love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. I often reflect on this in my own personal devotions, that text, because Paul could have written, but because of his great love for us, God made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. He could have said that, and that's true. But it's almost like a parenthetical part there he puts in there. But because of his great love for us, God, who, by the way, is rich in mercy, lest you feeble people forget this, because it's his mercy that brings us into this relationship that he has not caused us to die, but given us grace in these things. He is the one who, by his mercy, has shown us grace, made us alive with Christ. And you see, friends, when we think about doing things as Christians, the, the imperatives that will be given to us here, the things that we are to do that Paul says here, don't ever forget the mercy of God that undergirds this. And that flows through us so that we will more lovingly, graciously, and mercifully show this kindness to others as God has shown us. So that's just the preamble. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, okay, then you get to, what do you want me to do, Paul? To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now, the picture of sacrifice would have been quite clear in the minds of all of Paul's readers, Jew or Gentile. They would have understood sacrifice, whether from the Jewish context and the Old Testament and the sacrificial system that was imposed on them to, to show them God's grace and mercy and point them to the greater sacrifice, Jesus Christ. But even to the pagans of their day, they had their pagan gods, and they would know what sacrifice is all about. You want to appease the pagan god, so you would sacrifice something, whatever it might be. And so they would understand understand this perspective very clearly, but Paul takes the whole perspective of sacrifice to the greater level. I mean, really, if we were to stand here and say, what's the greatest sacrifice God ever made? Well, we know is Jesus Christ. He sacrificed his life for us. And here, Paul is saying, in response to all that God has done for you, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, because this is holy and pleasing to God. It is that which delights God, 
and it's your true and actual and proper worship. This is how we worship God. We please God, we worship God by offering our lives as sacrifices. And here is that, that sort of statement that doesn't make sense to the world. We, in order to live, we have to die. We have to give up sacrificial ourselves in order to truly live. That's the principle that Jesus teaches us in Luke chapter 9, 23 and 24. Then Jesus said to them all, whoever wants to be one of my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will save it. And again, the, the principle that Jesus teaches us and that Paul echoes here is that true discipleship is not simply a matter of saying yes to Jesus, signing on the dotted line, following a few rules, and going back to the rest of your life. That's not Christianity. That's not discipleship. That is what some people tell you today. They're saying, look, if you want to get to heaven and be a disciple of Jesus, just, just, just say yes to Jesus, whatever that means. Or, or do this or do that and, and, and be a good person and, and love one another and, and, and so on and, and everything. That's not Christianity. I read, uh, there's a number of different sites I read, but one was talking about a, a Christian author, so-called, talking about Father's Day and, and love from the Heavenly Father. And it was wonderful. And it wasn't incorrect per se. But what the problem was, there was vast components missing from it. Talking about the love of God the Father to all his people without identifying specifically who those people are. Talking about the love of God that has for us and the love we should show for us without ever once referencing the love that was shown through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And that this is not only expression of God's love for us, but the way we to our express our love to him. Death to self. Dying to my wants. Literally sacrificing my life for Jesus. And again, you have other texts that you can look at. I, I, we don't have time to flesh all of these out, but I would suggest, for instance, you go back and look at Romans chapter 6, where Paul talks about being, we have died to sin, how can we live it any longer? Romans 6, 1 and 2. But later on, he talks about offering ourselves to God. As we offered ourselves to sin, now we offer ourselves, just as we have here in Romans 12, to God. We've died to our past. By doing this, then our sacrifice is holy, set apart, and pleasing to God. Do you understand that as a reconciled believer in Jesus Christ, that you now have the capacity to actually please the sovereign, holy, majestic, eternal, living, and only true God? Do you realize that? Some people struggle, well, you know, how do I please God? And we think, well, we've got to, you know, do better on this or, or do that. As a child saved, you are right with God. And now your life, as you live for him, pleases him. You kids out there today, think about this for a moment. Isn't it often your desire to please your parents? We don't always do too well at it, is it? Say yes. <laughs> we want to please our parents because they love us. And even though we don't always agree with them, yes, we want to please them. And, and they show us how to please them. Do you understand, kids, that if you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you can please the God who created us. That he's happy with the life you live for Jesus. It makes, if you can use the language, God smile. And so it is for all of us that we now have the capacity because of Christ our Savior to please God. It's our ple pleasing and holy service to God, which is our true and actual proper worship before Him. Worship is all of life. It's what we do as Christians. So without taking more time to think of that first point, it's, it's significant for us that to remember in light of who God is and, and all that He has done, we are called to give ourselves in sacrificial living worship for Him. What does that mean? I'll leave the applications for another time. But it does mean simply this, that your life is dedicated completely to Christ in all things. He is both Savior and Lord of your life. The two are never separate in Scripture. We cannot teach people, make Jesus your Savior. And as you grow and, and understand things, then you can make him Lord of your life. You will never find that in God's holy word. 
Jesus Christ is Lord of everyone, everything right now. And if you're a believer in him, he is both Lord and Savior of yours. And so your life now is in response out of love and grace to serve our living God. That's our sacrificial worship. And if we understand that, first of all, then all the imperatives of how we should live later on in Romans 12 really start to make sense. Because that's just the natural outflow of a heart who loves God. I want to serve Him. I want to do these things. Absolutely. But let's notice secondly here, verse 2, and quite quickly here, just as we see that. There's a second undergirding thought as we look at all these things that we're to do by faith, is the transformed and renewed mind. Do not conform, verse 2 says, to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, perfect, and pleasing will. Now often we start at the back end of that verse, how do we know the will of God? And we could spend a whole series of sermons on that section. But I want you to see the upfront where it takes us to that point, and it all has to do with the transformed and renewed minds. I mean, how many of us, when we think about Christianity and when we talk about salvation, the first reference is about the heart? Isn't that true? Usually, we think about the heart. And that's true. We talk about the need for God to change our hearts, Old Testament and New Testament, taking out the heart of stone and putting a heart of flesh, and the imagery is often we need a change of heart. And absolutely. But sometimes left to the periphery is the mind. And Paul says, if you're going to live out the truth of God's word and please your holy God through sacrificial life, you need a renewed and transformed mind. Notice how Paul places that for us here. The contrasting phrases, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. The idea of conformity and, and transformation that are used here in, in contrasting things clearly show us a wonderful picture that the world wants to shape us. There's the whole idea of non-conformity to the world. The scriptures are full of uh, images of what this world means. Uh, the old uh, Phillips translation puts it this way, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. And, and that's what the world is trying to do. If you go back to these phrases like ideas have consequences in philosophy and so on, the attempt is to capture the minds of everyone. And I think specifically for any, you know, high school students and college students, pay very, very careful attention to what I tell you is that by and large, the world and the universities and higher education there, they want to capture your mind. And it is not to please God, but it is to rather to set you apart as the pinnacle of evolution, that we are in control. If you were watching PBS back in the 1980s, you would have seen the cosmos with Carl Sagan. And the very first words out of his mouth as the camera pans towards him on that wonderful shore and the, the crashing waves. And he comes to that point. The cosmos, he says, is all that is or was or ever will be. And thus we're entered into the very foundational principle of secularism. That this is all there ever was or ever is or ever will be. Sounds almost biblical. If you take God out of that and put that there instead of cosmos, it would be. But you see, that's the standard of our world's thinking. That we as human creatures have gained the, the highest rung on the ladder. We dictate the future. We're in control of our destiny. It's the cosmos that's all that's ever been there and ever will be. And that secularist agenda is what the world is trying to teach us and feed us all the time. And until we as Christians realize that, we will be taken in by it all the time. That's the reality of the world. And so Paul says, don't be conformed by the pattern of this world. Don't let it shape you and mold you. Don't let it do those things. But rather, he says, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. As Christians, we need to kick into gear our thinking, our minds, so that we will be able to recognize this world and its sad reality before us. The renewal of a mind is a mind that understands the culture, but speaks to it through the truth of God's Word. 
I think part of our problem as modern day Christians, any Christians of any day, is that we surmise that thinking with a Christian mind is just thinking about Christian things. That the, the way we Chris think as Christians is just think about Christian stuff. Well, Christian stuff is good, whatever you want to put in there. But I think what Paul is teaching us here with renewed minds, think about all of life, all of culture, understand the arts, understand the political ramifications of distress in this country and so on, understand the philosophies of the world, understand why children sing this song and do that, understand all these things, but through the guidance of the truth of God's Word, you see. We do not abandon culture, we don't put it aside, but bathed in the truth of who God is and His Word, we engage the culture. We engage in philosophical discussions. We engage in the care of the needy and those around us. We are planted here to do that for the glory of God. The concern is for the battle today of the minds of people. And if we are not on the front line of that, then we're going to be losing that battle. It says, so we need to be renewed in our minds by the gospel itself. Now, again, you can go to other texts. I would just encourage you, look at uh, Ephesians 4, uh, 17 and following, particular verse 23, where, where Paul makes very clear this same principle that we used to conform to this world and all it was doing, but now we conform to Christ, to his word. And this is where we engage the world from the truth of Scripture. Now, if all this takes place, Interestingly enough, that's what leads us to finding God's will. Then, if this is taking place, you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, perfect, and pleasing will. Isn't it interesting? As Paul begins to say here, you, you want to know what God has for your life, then live out these principles. And finding God's will will not be so hard. We keep trying to find God's will as this sort of, as one author put it, the th- single dot theory. God has this single dot theory, this single thing of his will for me. I need to find that. Paul says here, as your minds are renewed, you'll discover what God's will is. It is to sacrificially serve him and see him guide you into all of life. Oh, there are so many applications here. But let me just suggest that the way to see this happening, particularly in the capturing of our minds, we start with God, his character, his holiness, who he is. And then we look to humanity and who we are. And then we discover the problem and find the answer is, as it always has been, Christ alone. See, the beauty of this is the reminder that God is, for his glory, working through his people. The call for you and I then today is to trust in him. And if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, you're, you're battling against things you will lose. Trust in Him alone. See Him as the God of all creation and know His mercy through Christ today. But if you're a Christian, look at this text again. Where do you fit into that? How is this challenging you in order to transform your culture? What's happening to our culture? I'm not sure. But I believe we as Christians are called to be on the front lines of change in our culture. And it's the gospel that drives us. It's what drove Paul in his day. And it will drive you and I and never fail us in our day as well. So may God, as we begin to think through these principles in our life, remind us of his grace, lead us in his mercy, and give us his peace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beauty of the gospel, the character of our God who teaches us how we should live, how we should then live. Lord, use these things to motivate us, to guide us, to direct us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.